Good morning, I'm Kenneth Moten. And I'm Janae Norman here. The top five things to know it's Thursday. Number one, the breaking news in the Middle East. Kurdish fighters guarding ISIS militants in Syria are leaving their positions after Turkey launched airstrikes and a ground offensive. The attack got underway just days after President Trump withdrew U.S. troops from the region. Civilians fleeing the area are among at least seven people killed. Meanwhile, a U.S. official says at least two notorious ISIS fighters have now been relocated to prevent them from escaping in the chaos. Number two, the impeachment standoff in Washington. President Trump is digging in on his refusal to cooperate. He's now threatening to take his fight to the Supreme Court. The president has claimed that the whistleblower who raised alarm about his phone call to Ukraine has ties to one of his Democratic opponents. But lawyers for the whistleblower are shooting down that allegation, saying their client is a civil servant who has never worked for or advised any political candidate or campaign. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who was listening to the call when President Trump asked Ukraine's president to investigate Joe Biden, came to Trump's defense in a new interview. It was consistent with what President Trump has been trying to do to take corruption out. I found that to be wholly appropriate to try and get another co country to stop being corrupt. Um, but the most important reaction is from President Zelensky himself, who said, no, I, I didn't feel pushed. I didn't feel pressured. Meanwhile, for the first time, Biden is now saying President Trump should be impeached. And Biden is not alone. A new Fox News poll shows 51 percent of registered voters believe the president should be impeached and removed from office. That's up nine points since July. On to number three now, the attempted attack on a synagogue in Germany. The gunman was seen firing his weapon in the city of Halle. He failed to force his way into a packed synagogue during Yom Kippur services because the door was locked. Ten Americans were among those inside. Police say the attacker was also unsuccessful at trying to use a makeshift bomb, but he fatally shot two bystanders. He was later arrested. Germany has faced an increase in anti-Semitic crime. We head to California for number four. Millions of people are without electricity this morning in what Pacific Gas and Electric calls a public safety power shutdown due to extremely dry, windy conditions. cge &E says it's trying to reduce the risk of wildfire sparked by wind-damaged power lines, but many people are furious. There are reports of someone shooting at a pg and &E truck and someone throwing eggs at a pg and &E office. And finally, number five, a special collection is getting a self-described regular guy a lot of attention. Seven years ago, Ian Squires vowed to wear a different tie to work every day. His collection is up to nearly 1,600, which he shows off on a blog that's now being followed by 30,000 people. The truth is, I'm a mediocre guy, stuck in a mediocre world, just trying to artificially create some sunlight somewhere. It's something to do, it's, it's, it's to amuse myself. It all started with a tie he got at a thrift store for $1.50. His rules are no repeats and all the ties have to cost around $1. So that's, what, $365 a year? About $16,000 if that's how many he's got. Ooh, you're good at the math. <laughs> All right, let's get right to the big story, the breaking news in the Middle East. Turkey is launching a punishing assault on Kurdish fighters in Syria. The airstrikes and ground offensive against a crucial U.S. ally is getting underway just days after President Trump withdrew U.S. troops from the border region. At least seven civilians have been killed as families scramble out of harm's way. Many Kurds guarding ISIS prisoners have been forced to flee, raising concern that those prisoners, some of the most dangerous people in the world, could now scatter. ABC's Megan Tavrizian has been tracking this all night. Megan, good morning. Good morning, Janae and Kenneth. Uh, this morning, Turkey claims to have struck 181 targets in Syria, and the Kurds reporting at least two deaths and multiple civilian casualties. This morning, Turkey escalating its attacks in Syria, launching airstrikes, firing artillery, and now a ground attack, targeting Kurdish fighters, longtime allies of the U.S. This comes just days after President Trump abruptly pulled U.S. troops from the region as Turkey prepared to launch an operation to clear out Kurdish forces there. Turkey's president claiming Kurds are terrorists. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo pushing back on allegations the president gave Turkey the green light. Yeah, well, that's just false. Uh, the United States didn't give Turkey a green light. The Kurds have been on the front lines against ISIS, fighting alongside American forces for years. But now those fighters, once guarding ISIS prisoners, are being pulled away to reinforce the front line against Turkey. The president was pressed about the danger that ISIS prisoners could now escape. 
Well, they're going to be escaping to Europe. That's where they want to go. They want to go back to their homes. U.S. defense officials confirming two high-value British men accused of being involved in ISIS executions of Westerners are in U.S. military custody and moved to a secure location. The president threatening retaliation if Turkey does anything he considers off-limits. I will wipe out his economy if that happens. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham, a staunch ally of the president who disagrees with the troop withdrawal, says he's come up with a bi bipartisan agreement on severe sanctions against Turkey. Those sanctions would prohibit U.S. military sales to Turkey and target the country's leadership. Janae. All right. And Megan, how is the international community reacting to Turkey's military action in Syria? The U.N. Security Council meeting, they're meeting today in a closed meeting, but it's unclear what, if anything, they can do. All right, Megan, thank you for joining us. And moving on, the impeachment standoff is escalating as President Trump digs in on his refusal to cooperate in the investigation, vowing to take his fight to the Supreme Court. And the president is firing back at Joe Biden after the former vice president said for the first time that he should be impeached. ABC's Rachel Scott has the details. In the battle over impeachment, President Trump defiant and ready to fight. Probably ends up being a big Supreme Court case. Maybe it goes a long time. I don't know. The White House drawing a line in the sand, refusing to cooperate with the impeachment investigation. And now the president announcing former Congressman Trey Gowdy, a former prosecutor who led the House Benghazi investigation, is joining his legal team. The White House calling the impeachment inquiry unconstitutional and baseless. President Trump firing off several tweets labeling the impeachment inquiry as ridiculous, defending his conversation with the president of Ukraine yet again as a perfect call. But according to a summary released by the White House, it was on that call that the president urged the leader of Ukraine to investigate his potential 2020 rival Joe Biden and his son Hunter. A whistleblower alleging the president abused his power then sounded the alarm. The impeachment showdown spilling over into the race for 2020. Biden is dropping like a rock. I don't think he's going to make it. Donald Trump has violated his oath of office, betrayed this nation, and committed impeachable acts. He should be impeached. Biden calling for Trump's impeachment for the first time. President Trump responded to Biden's comments within minutes, calling them pathetic. Biden tweeted back, thanking the president for watching, and asked him to stop stonewalling Congress. Janae, Kenneth? Yeah, thanks to Rachel there in Washington. President Trump says he's planning to get involved in the immunity controversy stemming from a crash that killed a British teenager. 19-year-old Harry Dunn died after being struck by a car driven on the wrong side of the road by the wife of a U.S. diplomat. She fled England claiming diplomatic immunity. Dunn's father says President Trump and British Prime Minister Boris Johnson need to take action. Everybody else in the world can see what she's done is wrong. Why can't they see that? I feel like I'm being an idiot because I can see it. We can all see yeah, it. Yeah. Why can't the two most powerful men in the whatever, why can't they see it? Seriously. The woman was driving on the wrong side of the road. And, and that can happen. You know, those are the opposite roads. That happens. It, uh, it was an accident. It was an ac It was a terrible accident. The president spoke to the British prime minister about the case Wednesday. Trump says the U.S. is now trying to arrange a meeting between the diplomat's wife and Harry Dunn's parents. America Airlines will be the first U.S. carrier to bring back the Boeing 737 MAX jets. An SEC filing revealed American plans to start using the aircraft in January. It was one of three U.S. airlines forced to ground the jet after crashes in March and last October killed 346 people. Meanwhile, Southwest has grounded two similar 737 jets after discovering cracks where the wings connect to the fuselage. The NG, or Next Generation, aircraft were among the oldest in Southwest's fleet. They were inspected as part of an emergency order from the FAA. The incoming mayor of Montgomery, Alabama, says tackling crime will be his first priority when he takes office. 45-year-old probate judge Stephen Reed will be the city's first black mayor. He run about two-thirds of the vote in a runoff election. Montgomery played a big part in the struggle for civil rights and was the first capital of the Confederacy. Reed will be sworn in November 12th. Frightening moments for two Miami construction workers. Their scaffold gave way, leaving them stranded more than 30 feet above the ground. One on the scaffold and the other dangling from a harness. Firefighters brought both men to the ground safely. Neither worker was hurt. The rescue took about 45 minutes. 
Now to the unprecedented power shutoffs in California, leaving millions in the dark and many of them furious. The state's department and largest utility is defending the preemptive outages because of scenes like this. Wind fueled wildfires. This one near Fresno. Pacific Gas and Electric says it's trying to prevent wind damaged power lines from sparking bigger and even more damaging fires. Overnight, darkness expanding across Northern California. Utility company PG&E started cutting electricity to customers in the Bay Area just after midnight in the second wave of planned outages, which have now affected nearly 2 million people across the state. This is an unprecedented event. The power company is preparing for high winds that could potentially bring down power lines and spark wildfires, trying to prevent a repeat of past disasters like the deadly campfire last year. At this point, um, we, we believe that it's definitely a necessary step to take for the safety of our, of our communities. This morning, a state of emergency has been declared in San Jose, where police say car crashes are escalating because of traffic lights being out. Classes at some schools are canceled. Others have their students working without electricity. Meanwhile, winds were still calm more than 12 hours after the first outages began. Look at those flags. No wind here at all. Frustration growing for many Californians, calling the outages an unnecessarily drastic step. I think they jumped the gun, in my opinion. Evidence of the anger seen on the windows of this P evidence of the anger seen on the windows of this PG&E office after someone threw eggs at the building. pg e in general should have taken care of this for the last 50 years. If they had taken care of this in the last 50 years, we wouldn't be having this now. And that extreme fire threat could last through Friday. After that, officials say it could take several days for power to be restored. Then moving on to some strong statements from Rihanna. She says she was offered and declined the opportunity to perform last February's Super Bowl halftime show. Rihanna, Rihanna telling Vogue magazine that she said no to the gig in support of former NFL star Colin Kaepernick. And she said, quote, I just couldn't be a sellout. Room 5 was the game's halftime entertainment. And U.S. authorities have seized nearly 15,000 pairs of fake Nike sneakers. They were recently found in Los Angeles and a shipment arriving from China. Customs officials say if the sneakers were real, their total price would have been more than $2.2 million. Up next, the live TV broadcast interrupted by an adorable intruder. But first, the woman accusing former Today Show anchor Matt Lauer of rape speaks out the new developments overnight and how Lauer is defending himself. Welcome back. We turn now to the sexual assault claim against former news anchor Matt Lauer. This morning, his accuser is speaking out. Lauer's public downfall two years ago sent shockwaves across the media world, and this morning, he's no longer staying silent about the rape allegation against him. This morning, Matt Lauer is speaking out for the first time since being fired by NBC in 2017 for what the network called sexual misconduct. The woman behind the complaint that led to his firing is Brooke Nevels, who worked with Lauer's co-anchor Meredith Vieira. Variety magazine obtained excerpts of the new book Catch and Kill by Ronan Farrow, where, according to Variety, Nevels tells Farrow that Lauer raped her during the Olympics in Sochi. Now, in a nearly 1,400-word letter, Lauer calls that account categorically false. Nevels reportedly told Farrow that one night after drinks with Lauer and Vieira, she went up to Lauer's hotel room where she says he pushed her onto the bed, flipping her over and forced her into a sex act. She says she wept silently into a pillow. According to excerpts obtained by Variety, Nevels told Farrow, I was too drunk to consent. It was non-consensual in that I said multiple times I didn't want to. She tells Farrow that once they got back to New York, she went on to have more consensual sexual encounters with Lauer and later told colleagues and superiors at NBC. But she claims nothing happened until Vieira urged her to go to Human Resources with a lawyer. Within 24 hours of that complaint, Lauer was fired. As I'm sure you can imagine, we are devastated and we are still processing. In his letter, Lauer describes the relationship as an extramarital affair that began in Sochi with a completely consensual sexual encounter, writing, she certainly did not cry. She was a fully enthusiastic and willing partner. Lauer says when the affair ended, Nevels tried to rekindle it, and he suggests she was financially motivated, writing, within a year, she was reportedly out trying to sell a book, and it appears that she also sought a monetary payment from NBC. Nevels tells NBC Lauer's letter was, quote, a case study in victim blaming. She writes, 
There is a Matt Lauer that millions of Americans watched on TV every morning for two decades. And there is the Matt Lauer who this morning attempted to bully a former colleague into silence. I am not afraid of him. NBC News chairman Andy Lack is defending the network's handling of Lauer's firing, saying some have questioned why we use the term sexual misconduct to describe the reason for Lauer's firing in the days following. We chose those words carefully to precisely mirror the public words at the time of the attorney representing our former NBC colleague. Lack denies there was any cover-up of Lauer's conduct. Flowers' accuser received a seven-figure settlement from NBC last year. Meanwhile, Andy Lack is facing allegations of his own. According to New York Post, Pharaoh's book claims Lack preyed on female employees. He has not responded overnight to that allegation. Let's take a break from the news here and check our notifications, starting with this reporter's son interrupting her live shot on national reporter. television. The MSNBC um, correspondent talking about Turkey uh, and Syria. And but and little boy, he don't care. Just wants his mommy. Yep. She said, sorry, my kid's here, and just kept on going. So that brings us to our question of the day. Do you have any funny stories about taking your kid to work? Tell us in the comments or tweet us at ABC News Live. Yeah, doesn't all of that kind of remind you of that BBC reporter? Oh, it does. Um, or analyst. He was, that, it was an incredible moment. And he was, he was uh, talking on TV. His kids came in. Kids came in. Loved it so much. Mom slid in there. So cool. Yeah. And here's a bizarre stick up, a scary situation. But what on earth is he wearing? He's covered in plastic bags there. All plastic on bags. On his face. Shoes. So I guess we won't get fingerprints or sh footprints, shoe prints, who knows. Yep, hard to identify that guy. Uh-huh. And some South Carolina high school students are being celebrated for what they didn't wear to homecoming. Homecoming court candidates at Strom Thurmond High School took the field barefoot last Friday. It was a show of solidarity for Natalie Deal. The 19-year-old has epilepsy and has had seizures for five years. Her family said she couldn't wear heels because her body isn't <laughs> stable. Deal's mom says she didn't realize how much her daughter was loved until that night. That's a, That's just good, a good moment story. there. Well, next to the war on plastic straws, eco-friendly restaurants are coming up with new ideas to complement your beverage. And this is our favorite so far, drinking from a tube of pasta. The idea hmm. apparently is taking off in Italy. One person said it's Italian engineering at its finest. It sure looks like it. And a hiking trip in Washington State included a memorable meeting. Jasmine Bartley and her family were and a state park Sunday when a bear strolled right on up to her teenage brother. She says everyone who had been near him ran up a hill when she realized what was going on. As the bear got close, she told her brother to stand still. He did. The animal took a few sniffs and then ran off. Uh, was that the best advice to stand still? Yeah, right? Stay right it's there. Like teenage siblings. Who's yeah, like, I'm we're going to run. Them. Stay there. And someone's in the Halloween spirit. Watch this tiger playing with a pumpkin. Uh... May end up accidentally carving it. Oh, look. Oh, and he crushed it. Sitting yep, your oh, pumpkin is. You're not going to be able to carve that for Halloween. Mm -hmm. it's... Even the even the tiger is getting in on the pumpkin spice. Grace. I love it. Well, Sesame Street has long been at the forefront of incorporating real life societal shifts into its programming. Over the years, it's introduced new Muppet characters that would better reflect the world in which kids live today. And now they've done it again. Carly is a character Sesame Street just introduced a few months ago, a six year old living in foster care. But this morning, Sesame Street is revealing much more about Carly and her story has the potential to help millions of kids like her. Will Gans reports. Hi, it's me, Carly. One of the I'm newest neighbors on Sesame Street, Carly, is the face of a brand new initiative to help families dealing with parental addiction. Carly's mommy has a disease called addiction. Addiction makes people feel like they need a grown-up drink called alcohol or another kind of drug to feel okay. Carly, representing one of the 5.7 million kids in the U.S. under the age of 11 who live with a parent struggling with addiction. My mom needs help learning to take better care of herself. Sesame Street saying in a statement, addiction is often seen as a grown-up issue. Our new resources are designed to break down the stigma of parental addiction and help families build hope for the future. In its historic 50 years, Sesame Street has helped kids tackle some tough topics, See, from dealing with racism. I'm brown and you're purple. Yeah, but I am best friends with you. To gender equality and women's rights. Look at the things that we women can do. To autism awareness and education. You're really good at painting. High five, Julia. 
Huh? Huh? High five? Now with Carly, Sesame Street hopes every kid in situations like hers will feel less alone. Sometimes things happen that little monsters can't control or fix, and that those things aren't their fault. Carly's story is part of the Sesame Street and Communities Initiative, and there are resources, including videos and storybooks, available in English and Spanish to anyone who needs them. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Well, coming up, we'll give you a look at the big events of the day ahead. Plus, the moment a young boy with cerebral palsy will never forget, and where and what it means to his family after this. Here's what to watch out for today. President Trump and Vice President Mike Pence traveled to Minnesota for a Keep America Great campaign rally at the Target Center in Minneapolis. New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy is set to lay out his strategy to address lead contamination. The announcement comes as Newark residents are battling a lead crisis. City officials are in the middle of a $120 million project to replace thousands of old lead pipes. A Florida man found guilty of manslaughter for killing an unarmed black man after an argument over a parking spot is set to be sentenced. Michael Draca faces up to 30 years in prison for killing Marquise McLaughlin in a case that put the state's stand your ground law in question. Actor Cuba Gooding Jr. is doing court for trial on allegations that he groped a woman at a New York bar. Gooding is pleaded not guilty to forcible touching and sexual abuse charges. And a court hearing is scheduled for rapper Cardi B who faces felony assault charges related to a fight at a New York City strip club. Plus, don't forget to tune in to The Debrief for an update on all our top stories and the briefing room for a breakdown of the latest headlines in politics. Finally, from us this morning, a young boy in Illinois living with cerebral palsy has lived out his dream on a football field. Last year, seven-year-old Bryson Jenkins wasn't able to walk. Last weekend, he served as the honorary captain for a youth football team in the northern city of Fox Lake. Then late in the game, Bryson took the field and ran for a touchdown. His mom says it was incredible. Bryson just, I mean, the look on his face, he's smiling from ear to ear. He was like that. Yes, he just was soaking up the attention. <laughs> mm. You see how excited he still was. His dad helped Bryson cross the goal line. He says it is a moment he'll never forget. He had never met those uh, team members there, and they surrounded him, applauded him, so celebrated him. Mm -hmm. That's it from us this Thursday. We will Thursday, right? Yes, Thursday. Oh, I definitely know tomorrow's Friday. Yeah. And we will see you tomorrow. Have a good one.